Just put my glasses on, give me a second. Uh, evening, everyone, lovely to see you. Uh, I'm Andy Haldane, I'm the Chief Executive here at the RSA. Fantastic to welcome you all here to the beautiful Great Room. And all those I know that are watching, uh, joining us uh, online this evening, you're very welcome as well. Um, it's a special evening, because I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome to RSA House and to the Great Room uh, tonight's very distinguished guest speaker, the Lord Speaker, um, of the House of Lords, uh, Lord McFall. Um, Lord McFall, John, uh, as we used to call each other, um, is, is the fourth Lord Speaker. Uh, since the post was created in 2006, he was elected in 2021 by a whole of house election. As many of you will know, prior to becoming uh, a peer in 2010, uh, John was MP between uh, 87 and 2010 uh, for De Barton and Western Bartonshire. And he also served very notably uh, in a very distinguished fashion uh, as chair of the House of Commons uh, Treasury Select Committee, presiding over a set of very memorable hearings, not least in the wake of the 2007-2008 uh, financial crisis. Memorable, not least for me, as I often be before John, uh, being quizzed on all manner of things. I can say that was with a, quite a degree of trepidation on my part. I would leave the house each morning telling my wife, today might be the day. I have more time on my hands by close of business. Um, but despite being a, um, uh, you know, a taxing environment, I should say that the distinguishing feature of John's uh, chairmanship of that committee was that he himself was always scrupulously fair. And I never had any doubt that John himself was seeking the truth and the right answers and not seeking to score political points. And I hugely appreciate, uh, John, the way you approached that. And many other people did uh, as well. And indeed, John's follow-up work, uh, well, he and I did a bit together, actually, on uh, banking standards and the Commission on Banking Standards uh, work. Uh, tonight uh, is the first, actually, uh, in the sequence of events we have, we have uh, Chris Bryant on House of Commons reform in a few weeks' time. Uh, we have Simon Case, the Cabinet Secretary, on civil service reform. Uh, and tonight uh, we have John, of course, on House of Lords reform, how we can uh, increase its effectiveness, how we can have uh, the upper house rise to what we all know are a very significant set of long-term challenges facing uh, this country, both economically uh, and uh, societally. So John will open up uh, with an address for 20 minutes or so, uh, and then uh, we'll go to a bit of conversation between us and then opening out to all of you uh, very quickly. I know there are huge numbers of questions uh, in the room and indeed online. We'll try to get to as many of those uh, as possible before seven o'clock. For those online, you can stick it in the chat or across social media using the hashtag, hashtag RSA Lords Reform. We'll wrap up promptly at seven. It only remains for me to offer the warmest of RSA welcomes to our fantastic speaker this evening, uh, John McFall, to speak to us on the future of the House of Lords. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, thank you. Andy, thank you for that welcome. Uh, this is the first time we've been on the stage together. It's usually uh, you're the other side of the table. But we did have many backstage uh, chats, as you know, and that was very important. And my relationship with the Bank of England and the Treasury Committee was absolutely vital because there was a triangle. The Parliament, the Bank of England, and 10 Downing Street. And how did we influence policy? And we certainly influenced that after the 2007 and 8 financial crisis because there was a great relationship between myself and the Bank of England. So thank you and your colleagues for that relationship, Andy. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to be invited to address this august gathering. The institutions we represent are both steeped in history. The Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce traces its roots 
to a meeting in Covent Garden Coffee House in 1754. And the House of Lords is a little bit older. <laughs> Throughout its history, the RSA has been at the forefront of support for new ideas and innovations in response to the challenges of the modern age. Sadly, I cannot claim the same has always been true for the Lords, which at times over the centuries has been accused of acting as a drag anchor impeding progress. But you might be forgiven for believing that that remains the case. Media coverage of the Lords focuses almost exclusively around appointments and individual members' alleged misdemeanours. And commentators regularly trot out demands for abolition as if this was a straightforward process which would resolve the shortcomings of our political system at a stroke. However, I will argue tonight that there is little understanding of the work which is actually done in the Lords, and I will make the case that this work is crucial to Parliament's most fundamental task, namely the production of good law. And I will urge anyone considering reform to give long and careful thought to whether their schemes will safeguard and strengthen the primary role of the upper house as a revising chamber, scrutinizing and improving legislation. Now, I'm not going to try to persuade you that the Lords is perfect in its current forum. There is no doubt that reform is needed. But in my non-party role as Lord Speaker, it's not my place to campaign for a particular blueprint but what I can argue for is a proper understanding of the Upper House and how it can best help the United Kingdom overcome its many challenges. So in this talk, I want to look at those challenges and set out the work of the Lords, helping deliver measured and effective responses that are fit for the long term. No one can doubt that we face a fearsome array of problems in this era of polycrisis. Conflict in Europe, climate change, uh, the delicate trade-off it requires between reducing carbon and protecting household budgets, financial instability and the cost of living, pandemic disease, mass migration and an ageing population. In fact, we have more 65-year-olds in the country now than, than under 15s. So it tells you something. We confront them at a time when trust in politics as a whole is at a low ebb, and when technological change is undermining the traditional forums for debate and dialogue. More than ever, the demands of social media and the 24-hour news cycle put pressure on elected politicians to focus on the short term. Within that context, I believe that Lords makes three distinctive contributions to the political process. First, we debate extensively the really important issues. Second, we bring genuine expertise to bear. And third, we conduct ourselves with respect for all. One criticism leveled at the democratic system is that the nature of party political battles encourages a focus on immediate headlines rather than long-term challenges. With a general election never more than five years away, the temptation is always to opt for the quick fix rather than the thorough repair job, which may involve sacrifice on the part of the electorate, with benefits which may not be felt until decades have passed. By contrast, the House of Lords Select Committees work on a cross-party basis. Their members are not seeking re-election, and the committees have a broader remit than the Commons counterparts. Every session sees a few dozen defeats on government legislation, which grab the headlines. But some of these defeats are subsequently overturned in the Commons. Some are accepted, and some lead to compromise between the Houses. This is as it should be. While it is within the rights of the unelected House to ask ministers to think again, it is ultimately for the elected politicians to make the final decision. What has a bigger impact are the amendments passed in the laws 
with government approval. There are typically 1,000 or more of these each year, and they often represent a minister listening to concerns and objections raised by peers and revising the government's plans in response. And a recent study by the UCL Constitution Unit found that around 55% of all changes to legislation made during the passage through Parliament stem from interventions in the Lords. However awkward this may be for ministers, many of them subsequently acknowledge that the process helps highlight practical differences and prevents unintended consequences. And this is where my second point about expertise is so important. Our members include many political appointees, and this is to be expected. The government needs front benchers to get its agenda through the House, and the opposition needs a shadow team to oppose it. Former ministers and secretaries of state can also, through the upper chamber, offer the benefit of their long experience leading government departments. But the red benches are also home to other eminent figures from all corners of the UK's public life. Scientists, doctors, diplomats, judges, captains of industry and leaders of trade unions. Campaigners for civil liberties and disability rights, environmentalists, academics and engineers. Their presence is a reflection of the fact that the life of the nation does not reside only in political parties, but is also expressed through institutions and organisations of many kinds. The Lords offers a powerhouse of knowledge and experience that any private consultancy would charge huge sums of money to access. The Economic Affairs Committee boasts and his former boss, Bank of England Governor Mervyn King, and Treasury Permanent Secretary, then Cabinet Secretary, Andrew Turnbull. The European Affairs Committee is chaired by the former National Security Advisor, Peter Ricketts, and includes David Haney, once the UK's permanent representative at the United Nations, and former MI5 Chief Eliza Manningham Buller has been an active member of committees on security and technology. Yet we also count among our number the homelessness campaigner John Bird, play school presenter and champion of racial equality Fluella Benjamin, and Hollywood filmmaker Beban Kidron, who has worked effectively on a global scale to promote the protection of children online. The Lords has been described by the constitutional expert, Professor Philip Norton, as, quote, an arena for the discourse of civil society, unquote. Its ability to draw on the expertise and experience of those at the pinnacle of so many spheres of human activity is a precious resource which should not be squandered. Another aspect of the second chamber, which should not be diminished, is the civility of its proceedings. Voters whose only exposure to Parliament comes from TV coverage of PM questions might be forgiven for thinking that Westminster is a rowdy place characterised by point scoring, put downs and fractious disagreement. They would be surprised to find that the Lords rarely hears a raised voice. The Lord Speaker is not required to silence belligerent members with cries of order, order. In fact, neither I nor the government have the power to control the business or decide who speaks. The House is a self-governing institution and it prides itself on conducting a courteous conversation during which members are able to disagree agreeably. I believe that this provides a pattern for respectful and reasoned debate in a public square increasingly dominated by tit-for-tat slanging matches. I hope this brief analysis will at least have persuaded you that the current framework of the Upper House contains merits which should not be lightly discarded. Now, I freely acknowledge that we would not create a second chamber this way if we were starting from scratch, but we're not starting from scratch. And history tells us that those who attempt to do so 
often see their plans run into the sand. In 1968, Harold Wilson tried to legislate to guarantee a permanent majority for the government in the upper house. He failed. In 1998, Tory Blair had plans for what he called a more democratic and representative chamber. He failed. In 2012, the Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition proposed 80% elected peers. Their plans also came to nothing. They failed because the radical proposals lacked consensus and lacked clarity on the powers of the newly constituted House. Similar proposals are being put forward now, but the same questions will be asked. What exactly are its powers? And most crucially, how would an elected House resolve differences with the Commons, particularly if the two Houses had majorities from different parties? As things stand, the elected House rightly enjoys primacy within Parliament. But would that hold if the Upper House was wholly or partly elected? Would elected senators regard themselves as having equivalent democratic legitimacy to their Commons colleagues? Or even more legitimacy if they were elected on a proportional system rather than first past the post? Would they back down in a dispute with the Commons and it's easy to see the potential for gridlock of the kind often seen in Washington. By contrast, consensual and incremental changes have succeeded. Harold Macmillan's introduction of life peerages in 1958, with the removal of most hereditaries in 1999, and the introduction of retirement in 2014, all helped usher in a more modern chamber where expert debate takes precedence over partisan feuding and a chamber with the confidence to ask the government to think again. But I and my predecessor as Lord Speaker, Norman Fowler, have pressed for further reform, not to the powers or responsibilities of the Upper House, but to its size, composition and appointments procedures. The House overwhelmingly supported the Burns Committee proposal set up by my predecessor, first put forward in 2017, to reduce the numbers of peers from the current figure of more than 800 with a two-out, one-in system for appointments and a 15-year term of office. The same committee has also proposed a system whereby party political places would be allocated <coughs> proportional to an average of seats in the Commons and votes in recent elections, rather than being in the gift of the Prime Minister. Reforms proposed in the Lords also include new powers for the independent House of Lords Appointments Commission, referred to as HOLAC, to vet all nominees, not only for propriety, but also for willingness to devote time to parliamentary work and conspicuous merit. I have myself highlighted the opportunity to rebalance the system of appointments to the crossbenches so more independent peers are nominated by HOLAC and fewer by Prime Ministers and departing Prime Ministers. Incremental changes of this kind could go some way to allaying public disquiet over appointments. And I believe that, looking more widely across the political landscape as a whole, there is a strong argument for considering systemic change. Andy referred to my chairmanship of the Treasury Select Committee. But in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, I learned the value of civic engagement, consensual working, and long-term perspective. It was clear to me at that time that politicians alone could not resolve the issues thrown up by the crash, but must engage wider society. I established an independent commission in the future of banking, a civic initiative outside Parliament, which brought together MPs of all major parties with individuals out with Parliament, with deep experience of banking, 
regulation and consumer protection, along with a Benedictine monk as ethics advisor. As a Labour MP, I reached out to Conservatives and Liberal Democrats to demonstrate cross-party collaboration on issues which were certain to challenge future governments of whatever political complexion. And I asked David Davis to chair the commission and invited Vince Cable to take part. Both took up the offer readily. This initiative led eventually directly to major changes in the law to make banking safer. I believe that in an age where trust in democracy is waning and we face long-term problems of fiendish complexity, we need a similar spirit of collaboration and consensus. Mass migration, global warming, artificial intelligence, these are all issues which will confront governments for decades to come, regardless of their political colour. Decisions must be made which will outlast a single parliamentary term. If we can establish consensus across politics and across society, we stand a greater chance of fostering the kind of stability which will help our nations weather the inevitable storms ahead. To take one example, it is clear that rapid progress in areas like artificial intelligence and virtual reality offer real opportunities to boost prosperity and connect people. But it is equally clear that they will impact the stability and safety of our society in ways which are hard for us to predict at this time. As legislators, we must seek a balance between the economic gains offered by technological advances and the new risks they create for social division and crime. In another policy area, we must find ways to boost productivity without constantly chopping and changing the environment within which businesses operate. This has been a perennial problem since the Second World War, a period when we have seen a succession of industrial strategies unveiled with fanfare, only to be dumped as the political mood shifts. A political system driven by five-year electoral cycles and regular reshuffling of ministers means that politicians are rewarded for novelty and the appearance of activity, whilst businesses depend upon a degree of consistency and stability in order to grow. But as Lord Speaker, I hope... Sorry. As we try to work out how to deal with complex issues such as these, it is surely time to recognise that one big obstacle we face is the nature of our political culture. It's been said that modern societies suffer from the three Ps. Populism, post-truth, and we rec recognise an own approach which offers easy answers, avoids difficult evidence, and sets interest groups against one another. We have difficulty working productively together, something that ought to be a core task of politics and politicians. On many big issues, we know the broad direction that we need to move in, but we don't move in quickly enough, and we seem unable to form a consensus around steps to be taken. I suggest that the disconnect between politics and policy contributes to a lack of real discourse and realistic conversations about our choices, a lack of trust and consensus with political strategies looking for dividing lines rather than areas of agreement, and a lack of coordinated and effective action. The challenge for the political community is twofold. First, to recognise the value of engagement with civil society, drawing on talents and experience from business, academia and community organisations. And second, to create the space for politicians to step outside the daily drama of Westminster and take a truly long-term perspective. So what are the key vehicles for this task? 
I can see a few possibilities, but I'm looking to you to add to the list during our conversation. Some are structural, increasing outreach from Parliament to civil society with new forums and new technology. This could involve <coughs> the establishment of commissions to establish the boundaries of consensus on major issues of contention. It could mean co-opting onto parliamentary committees individuals with up-to-the-minute knowledge of cutting-edge sciences, industries and social movements. And also, it could involve citizens' assemblies to debate fundamental choices facing our society. Other potential ways are cultural. Building mutual respect between Westminster and the devolved parliaments. As I have strived to do as Lord Speaker, creating a space within which people from widely differing political traditions can come together to debate ideas in an atmosphere of civility and common endeavour. Now, I would not suggest for a second that the House of Lords offers all those solutions. But as Lord Speaker, I hope you will forgive me for saying that I believe many of its features are ideally suited to the task of calm and reflective consideration which can make sense of the maelstrom of modern life. <coughs> it is a forum for civil society which understands the voices from outside politics, that they have much to contribute to a national divorce. It is an institution that believes it's important to listen to those with the most experience and expertise, not just those with the loudest voices. It understands <coughs> that patience and attention to detail are as important in crafting policy as innovation and experiment. Now, I know perfectly well that it has also features which confuse and sometimes anger voters. That is why I am a strong advocate of reform of the size of the House and the appointments process. But I believe that the Lord has lessons to offer to other parts of the political realm on how we can improve the effectiveness of politics in building consensus and forging a narrative which allows us to address the real issues which we face. The democratic settlement has been dominant in much of the world since the Second World War, and it's easy to assume that it will remain so. But if we look around the globe, we see troubling evidence of strains in that. In some nations, we see a politics of polarization, <coughs> excuse me, which seeks to capitalize on division rather than find consensus. In others, we see the tyranny of the majority, which sweeps aside the interests of minority groups. We see voters angry over changes to their way of life, which they feel have been imposed on them. And we see ordinary citizens avoiding engagement in political debate for fear of being shouted down and vilified. We see elected leaders misusing their democratic legitimacy to stifle other elements of the society, such as the courts and the media. We see a disdain for hard-won knowledge in favor of simplistic slogans. And we see the language of rancor and abuse crowd out the quieter voices of deliberation and reflection. And we see passion expended on passing controversies, while fundamental challenges to our future, future as a society are pushed to the margins. It may seem odd to call an elected body in aid when arguing defence of our democratic settlement, but the House of Laws is part of that democratic settlement, and a part which helps preserve the virtues of reasoned debate, civil dialogue, a long-term perspective, and an eye firmly fixed on the horizon. To those who see the upper house as undemocratic relic which should be swept away, I say, first seek to understand. Understand the contribution it makes to good lawmaking and understand the model it offers for a different way of doing politics. I believe it is a model which can help us find a way through the difficulties which assail us, which can bolster public confidence 
in the democratic system and which can offer that one precious commodity which all politicians must deliver, a thing called hope. Thank you. Well, thank, thank, you. You. thank you, John, um, for setting that out so clearly and compellingly and, and helping us to understand what the real role of the Lords is, actually. Uh, a real education on that. And let me maybe ping you a few questions and then we'll, we'll go to the audience quickly because we've got so many um, people in I know want to ask questions and indeed online. So we'll probably have a freshly, newly elected Prime Minister in the next 12 months or so, John. So they, they go to you and they say, John, what should I do? Um, on House of Lawns reform in particular, what, what, would your, what would your advice be to, to them about how You're to You're putting that? me in a most elevated position. <laughs> <laughs> OK, but if anybody wants my view on it, uh, I was a member of the Labour government from 1997 to... 2010. I was also an opposition politician from 87 to 97. So I know both sides uh, of the aisle uh, on that. The first year of the Labour government in 1997 saw us taking the whole year for devolution in Scotland and Wales. The whole legislative year. And the English MPs and ours were very patient with that. Now, at a time when we've got these global problems that I'm telling you about, at a time when the cost of living crisis is very much on our, on our agenda, Andy. And given my background with the Treasury Committee, I would say the main purpose uh, in the first year is to get the economy working. And that's very important. And to focus on the issues like productivity and engage with people on it and make them, uh, if you like, understand. Was it Woody Allen said, Success is 90% turning up, you know, so you go out and you talk to people. And I remember you, uh, in my surgeries as an MP, I would sit in my surgeries and uh, people would come in and talk to me about their problems. And they'd probably start in 1950 and 20 minutes later, well, uh, 1965. And then I would say, what can I do for you? And in many ways, for instance, I couldn't do anything for them, but I listened to them and they got the opportunity to speak to me and they could either say when they went out, well, I went in to see McFall and I really told him the whole thing. Or I went in to see John McFall and he's trying to help me uh, on that. So that aspect is important, Andy, and therefore in the first year of a government, if the decisions are taken in the Westminster circle alone, there's going to be signals uh, of trouble. So engage with people. Yeah. Very good. O on specifically around House of Lords reform, and you said there's been over the years no shortage of proposals that have, um, by and large, not got a great distance very quickly. Um, I mean, one of the latest incarnations, as you know, John, is the proposals in, in Gordon Brown's report for Keir Starmer the so-called assembly of the regions and the nations, you know, a, a more spatially representative upper house, if you like. I wonder what thoughts you had on, 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 that, on that proposal and um, whether you think that could be a way of moving forward. Well, <coughs> Gordon made this report, and I think it was about 145 pages, and I think there were two pages on House of Lords Forum. So <laughs> we've got a long way to go uh, on that. Assembly of the Nations. Well, I'm from Scotland, and people keep saying to me, well, the House of Lords, what are you doing as Lord Speaker down there? It's just a London-centric place. I says, it's not uh, London-centric. It's there for the whole uh, United Kingdom. We need to get more people in the House. We need to have more Scottish representation. We need to have them for all the peripheries, including Scotland. So <clears throat> we, need, we need to ensure uh, that, that more people come but when we are, are one reforms the House of Lords, you've got to ask what the purpose of the House of Lords is. And the purpose of the House of Lords is, as I said, to question the government. In 
my own way, what I used to say as a former teacher, the House of Lords, what it does is it gets legislation along and it doesn't particularly like the legislation. So it scrubs the face of the Commons and sends it back. But if they're persistent and they come along and the face is still dirty, we scrub it again, get the brillo on it, send it back. You see, if they come the third time, well, what our forebears have said, well, you've made your bed, lie on it. So that's the purpose of the House of Lords. Think again. And, the House, and what the House of Lords does there is it enables democracy because it's the elected House that takes the decision on that. The second aspect <coughs> is the composition of the Lords. Do we want a House of Lords that's a mirror image of the House of Commons? Or do we want something that's different? Do we want the expertise and experience there? Do we want the uh, uh, independent cross-benchers there? And in fact, I uh, engaged with the Prime Minister very recently, and I said, look, we don't have enough independent experts coming in the House of Lords at the moment. Why is that? Because I mentioned House of Lords Appointments Commission established in 2000 uh, by Tony Blair. Uh, in 2011, by that time, that 11-year period, there were 59 uh, cross-bench independent members put forward. But for whatever reason, David Cameron wrote to Holak in 2012 and said, keep it contained at two members per session. Hmm. With the result now that in the subsequent 11 years, there have been 15. So I want a House of Lords that's different in composition yeah. to the House of Commons, and that is very important. And just on that, John, when, when you... Um look around the world, um, <clears throat> other models, examples there that you think, oh, they've got their second chamber just right. We could, we could learn from them, or indeed not learn from them. Remember there's some bad, you, you mentioned that you, you had no designs on a, a US type um, um, second chamber. So is the models, things internationally we can look to and learn from, do you think? I think we can, but if, uh, if I remember collectively, there's about 79 or 80 uh, second chambers around the world, and I think everyone is criticised. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we, we take the best uh, from that, Andy. Uh, and there, there's a lot, to, a lot to learn from Scandinavian countries uh, and others. And, you know, look at the situation in the Republic of Ireland when they had the abortion debate. Yeah. They had uh, civic entities discussing the, yeah. whole, the whole issue. Elements like that are important that, that we can pick up, but I want the core elements of the House of Lords to remain in terms of the, the purpose of it and the composition. I think that's important. Uh, just on your final point there about the Irish experience and their debate about abortion, and indeed that of other countries, yeah. you mentioned you could see a role for citizens' assemblies as a forum for discussing particular issues and getting direct feedback from the, the country on how to navigate some of the trickier issues they face. You'd support that, not as an alternative to, to a second chain, but as a sort of complement to it. Well, it's not for me to put proposals, because I'm uh, non-political in, in this, but I'll give you my experience with the Treasury Committee, and you'll know this. With the Treasury Committee, I had three purposes as the Treasury Committee as chairman. One, to keep all my members satisfied, because they could turn out to be a fractious lot. So I spent a lot of time engaging with my members and I gave them a bit of time in the sun, each one of them. Second, to educate the House because there isn't much debate in economic issues. You know, it's just seen as expertise. So we, we actively took part in the education debate, uh, the child vouchers and, and other issues and, and Gordon's infamous 10 pen tax. You remember that one? So with a big hand in that. So that was the second issue. But it was the third element that it was reaching out to people that was really, really important. And Andy, you will remember from your turn, time in the Bank of England, we had the Treasury, we had the Financial Conduct Authority, to, and with the Bank of England, not once did they meet together. Nope. There's a healthy rivalry between them, would you agree? Right, okay. But I, insi <laughs> I insisted that I wanted the three of them together. And Mervyn, well, wait a minute, what's this, you know? Whatever. But we got it at the end of the day. We went on the internet 
and we got over 5,000 questions wow. from people wow. on it for questioning. So we put those questions to people. And I also put a lot of effort in the language because financial language is uh, a language of its own. But quantitative easing, I know this, this isn't the most appropriate term, but printing money, okay. Uh, if right. you don't like the printing money, just give me an easy term to use in that. And then you could, people could understand what you were doing as a result of that. And I mentioned to you about Woody Allen. Uh, Halifax Building Society went down the plug. And a suggestion was put to us that we go up to Halifax itself uh, to consult people. And I thought to myself, well, well yeah, I'll be quite happy to go up to Halifax, but I need a few bodyguards. <laughs> uh, because Halifax itself, uh, the Halifax uh, Bank, was, you know, everybody almost in Halifax worked in that. But what we did is that we convened a meeting in a local hotel uh, for a room for about 50, 60, and 300 turned up as a result of it. And one of my colleagues uh, got into a, a bit of a scrap with some of the members, so I could stand up as a saint and say, now, come on, folks, just let's have a, a discussion on it. They settled down, and they were still rightly very angry about what had happened. But at the end of it, they said, well, you come up here and you listen to us. Mm -hmm. And that is a good model. Makes all the difference in the world. Let's go to the floor and collect some questions for, for John, then we'll go uh, and collect some uh, online. I think the first hand up was probably... Um, just wait for the microphone. Hi there, thanks very much. Um, two things I'd love to see. I'd like to have your opinion on them, and if they're reasonable, how would we go about them? One would be an age limit, so no one over 70. It's sometimes a bit of embarrassing watching on TV. The House of Lords seems a little bit like a Toastmasters in an aged care facility and certainly doesn't feel like expertise. So can we do that? And secondly, how do we make sure there is adequate expertise there? Because my sense from watching is that a lot of members wouldn't know the difference between data and metadata, or things that are going to be really, really critical uh, as we move forward on the AI space, et cetera. So age and expertise, if we want to make a real difference, how yep. do we do that? Well, the Burns Committee was set up by my predecessor, and, and I've supported that. And they recommended a 15-year limit uh, on that, uh, which I agreed with. But quite a number of people who come into the House of Lords with experience and expertise have had their career in the past people at Lord Chief Justice, military chiefs uh, and others, they would come in and maybe they would come in about 60, 65 uh, on that. So given the, that situation, I don't know if I'd firmly go for a retirement age of 70 or 75. I was on the, the Parliamentary Commission for Banking Standards, Andy knows this. The Archbishop of Canterbury was on it from the House of Lords, because he had finance background. But Nigel Lawson was on it, former chancellor. And I think Nigel was 82 at the time. Yeah, well, but he made a great contribution to that committee because he knew where the bodies were buried uh, on that. So I don't want to set stuff like that in, in stone. Uh, and if you had a 15-year term, somebody that comes in at 30 years of age, and I don't know, uh, uh, that they would be out at 45 uh, as a result of that. But we need an age because you could have somebody in at 30 been in the House of Commons for 40, 45 years. So I don't uh, go with a strict age, but uh, the 15 year limit is worthy of consideration. Very good. Uh, I'm going to go to this side of the room in the spirit of uh, balance. <coughs> Thank you. Hi. Given your clear exposition of the functions of the House of Lords, John, uh -huh. i.e. Uh, to challenge and the composition of experts and independent-minded people. Sorry. Um, given that, how can we make any difference to the way outgoing prime ministers anoint their friends to the House of Lords, most of the 
most of people, mostly people who wouldn't necessarily qualify given your description of the real function of the House of Lords. Oh, yeah, uh, Andy. That was just about um, uh, whether you agree with the role Prime Minister's play mm -hmm. in uh, the appointments procedures to the House of Lords, appointing their, their friends and yeah. relatives in some cases. As well, well. The, um, the Prime Minister has whip hand. I mean, as Lord Speaker, uh, or even the government leader, uh, we don't know who's coming in uh, the House of Lords. I read it in the papers the same as everybody else. And uh, one would say there's been quite a number of people uh, coming in with Prime Minister uh, nominations. In fact, since 2016, I think there have been something like 169 peers come in to the House of Lords, and over a quarter of that, 42, were in resignation honours list. Hmm. Now, the former leader of the House of Lords, Conservative leader, uh, leader of the House of Lords, uh, she put down an amendment to Lord Norton's bill saying that resignation honours uh, should cease because if a Prime Minister nominates people to the House of Lords when they're serving, they're accountable for them. Yeah. There's an accountability element. But if you nominate, pardon this style it was, if you nominate uh, members on resignation honours list, the Prime Minister's left. Uh, no, so I, I would go, I would think that's worthy of consideration. That element is, is really important. And HOLAC, the House of Lords Appointments Commission, we've advocated that on a statutory basis. And uh, there has to be, as far as I'm concerned, some scrutiny of people coming in the House of Lords for the conspicuous merit, uh, but also uh, to ensure that they are willing to contribute to the House of Lords. So if we did that, take away the two per, per, uh, parliament, uh, or two per uh, parliament with that, then I think that would help the situation. Fantastic. I'm going to take a couple from uh, online. By the way, we had five and a half pages of questions sent in in advance of this. <laughs> uh, let me pick one or two of them. Should we have a civic assembly on the future of the House of Lords? Well, I think you get the thread of my speech tonight, and it is, I'll put this question to you. If we fix the House of Lords, is politics sorted out? Eh? Answer, Andy. It's a rhetorical question, John, isn't it? Uh... <laughs> right, so I think that there has to be a systemic look at, as I mentioned in my, in my speech, on that. Uh, when I became Lord Speaker, I was very much aware that in the devolved assemblies, the relationship between the devolved entities uh, and Westminster it wasn't very good. So uh, I went round the parliaments, I went to Northern Ireland, it met all the political parties there, all keen to contribute. Uh, I went to Scotland and I went to Wales and I established the Interparliamentary Forum to look at Brexit. Now, bringing them all together, uh, there was no formal arrangement with it. It was informal arrangement. But members were able to engage with each other on mm -hmm. uh, that, and uh, it worked very, very well. So we would go up to Scotland, there'd be an SNP chair of it, Bruce Crawford, and business would go ahead with that. Mark Drakeford, in speaking at the Institute for Government, said the House of Lords was invaluable for Wales in getting what they wanted with the Brexit yeah. bill yeah. on that. So that informal element is really important, Andy. And if I go back to Ireland, when I was opposition MP, I was asked to join the British-Irish political body, and it was in the 1980s. And to be honest, there wasn't much to talk about, but you had a good session in the evening, and that was about it. <laughs> it was a... <laughs> but when it came to the peace process, uh, I was a minister over there uh, for a while. I knew the characters uh, in Dublin. And in terms of engagement, that helped very, very much. So that informal element, you know, I, wouldn't, I would stress that that is really, really crucial. And so therefore, we've got to rebalance the relationship between, if you like, what some would say is the exceptionalism of Westminster 
meeting people on an equal basis, and that's what we did in the Interparliamentary Forum. And that is crucial, Andy. Perfect. Let's go back in the room. Uh, we'll go this side. Uh, the, right here, please. Hi. Given the, the increasing mood towards more secular society and less religion, uh, what are your thoughts on the automatic appointment that we currently have of the bishops uh, in terms of the comments that you've made about proportional representation and people from wider fields? Mm. Well, there's 25 Anglican bishops in the House of Lords, and it's part of the constitutional arrangement, so we'd have to uh, look deeply at that. Uh, I've no doubt if there was a view, review that that aspect would be looked at. But let me give me uh, my personal view uh, that a number of the bishops uh, there uh, play a really good part in the House of Lords. Uh, and I base that comment on my experience as an MP because in my constituency, uh, visiting various communities, particularly communities of low income and whatever else, I would always contact the churches uh, and chat to them about the issues which were in their, in their communities and always got a good readout uh, from those results. So what I'm saying is there will be a more likely review of the, the bishops, but I would encourage uh, members from different faiths to be in. And I think already in the House of Commons, we have represented the Jewish, uh, the Muslim, and the Sikh community. I would welcome that. The Catholic community hasn't come in because canon law doesn't allow that. But uh, get representatives from different communities and get a variety of opinions from the community itself. And I'll, I'll give you one example. The Bishop of St Albans, uh, when I was Senior Deputy Speaker years ago, he came to see me and said, look, why don't we do something about gambling? And we took it up and we ended up with a committee in gambling. And it was a very significant committee that influenced legislation uh, as a result of that. And that was an initiative from a bishop. So I would welcome representation from all faiths. Back online. John, should we remove peers who fail to attend and vote on a regular basis? <clears throat> right. There are many peers are there in the House of Lords, but 800, sorry, 860. But the average attendance is about 420 to 450 every day. So you have a working population of that. And as is, again, I can't give a prescription for it, but maybe it's worthy of looking at a situation where you would have uh, an honours list where you'd have peers uh, who wouldn't be working in the House of Lords, but there would be an honour given to them if need be, right. but you'd have the working population of about 420 to 450 every day. There's quite a number of uh, options for, for getting numbers down, but uh, for the peers that uh, don't turn up at all, perhaps that's a way forward. Is there any chance, John, you could transplant some of the civility you spoke about in the upper chamber? into the lower chair. Is that just a ridiculously naive question? OK, well, I can tell you, Andy, I was uh, 23 years in the House of Lords, yeah. and I turned from being a sinner in the House of Commons <laughs> to a saint in the House of Lords. OK. <laughs> so it, it, the nature of the debate is different in the House, because I mentioned earlier, most peers uh, have had their career in their going in, and uh, they're not striving, there's no, in many ways there's not another rung in the ladder as a result of that. Yeah. But when you're in the House of Commons, there's also a, a sort of fierce debate. Ta the late Tam Dell, who's a good friend of mine, uh, Tam was a persistent uh, uh, member of Parliament, he sidled up to me just after him in the House of Lords and he says, John, everybody here likes you. But he said, as soon as you get above any of them, they'll hate you. Keep that in mind. <laughs> so it's a very competitive environment. And I, and I don't think you can take that competitiveness away. But back to the Treasury Committee, I chaired it for 10 years. The most difficult subjects, as you know, Andy, we get unanimous reports all the time. Mm -hmm. So there is an element, in, particularly in the committees in the House of Commons, where they, can, they work uh, cooperatively, and that's important. But in the bare pit of Prime Minister's questions, you know, it, it is a bit different. Never and, the members of parliament have got an eye in their constituency as well, you know, with the local papers. 
And there's a golden rule. If you're going to ask a question, at Prime Minister's question, don't go over 40 seconds. But get your punchline in then, you know. <laughs> and a lot of people can't resist that. <laughs> Let's go back in the room. Uh, we'll go this side. We'll go down the front here, actually. Thanks, Kills. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned that the House of Lords is like a teacher uh, editing and checking the students um, about how they draw a face. Um, it is a check on government, and you've clearly indicated support for its current form with some reforms. Um, yet, what about the court system and the justice system? Um, in other common law countries, the courts check the government and check laws and check actions, say like the House of Commons or their equivalent, um, uh, what laws they would pass. Uh, so let's take like the United States or maybe India, which have more partisan uh, upper chambers. Um, you have the courts there that are able to check uh, the legislation that are passed. Uh, so what do you think about the court system? Is that not capable of checking laws in the same way that House of Lords does? Well, actually, we did have the judges in the House of Lords. And when the Lord Chancellorship, I think it was uh, 2005, 2005, uh, the judges uh, were out, went out of the House of Lords and were in the Supreme Court, aside from it. And I think, as a constitutional uh, approach, that having a separation between the legislator uh, and the judges, I think, is really important. So I wouldn't advocate judges getting in the middle. And I'm not going to comment too much in America, but in the past year, you've seen the controversy with the Supreme Court. You know, so get a separation there uh, and, and have clarity, define the different roles. <clears throat> one more, um, certainly in advance. Very quick answer this one, John, actually. Will the House of Lords be reformed before the Palace of Westminster is renovated? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, put this, I'm joint chair of the Restoration Renewal Programme <laughs> in the House of Parliament, and I'll tell you, before the end of the Restoration Renewal Programme, I'll be long gone, and maybe I'll be gone for the earth as well. <laughs> Let's take more questions. We'll go here uh, and here on this side. Um, a couple more minutes left. Yeah. Thank you. I um, really enjoyed Lord McFall's uh, passionate defence of tradition. I think tradition is good in some cases, but I think this is a tradition that needs to go, really needs to go, because I think British people need a new beginning. And by that I mean uh, you know, we have, a, we have a House of Commons, which is functional, whatever you may, may disagree with it, but it's an elected, functioning body. We have um, Supreme Court, which is functioning, which functions extremely well. In fact, it's highly regarded around the world. However, our House of Lords, this fossilized institution, is not regarded with much regard. And I don't think Britons themselves regard the House of Lords as a particularly valuable institution. I think what we need now, Frank Lord McFall, you're a Labour Party socialist, like one, I think. I think we need to give up on this. We need to give British people a chance to try out um, a second chamber which is in which they have a role. So perhaps 400, 500 of our regions across this country should all be allowed to take participate. I'll make one concession, however. You know the French have something called the Académie Française? I think we need another chamber, perhaps a third chamber, a chamber of our elders, of our, um, of our wise men and women, we need that, because I think it's really critically important. You've actually Thank mentioned you. that. Some of those people in, 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 in the Lords who belong, for example, to the defence sector or the security Thank sector you. and so forth. Yeah, great. Yeah, fact, Thank you. We need those as well. John, Thank third you. chamber. Oh, third chamber. I'll tell you what, you know, the killer question where third chamber is, you go out, consult the public and say, do you want more politicians <laughs> 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 on that? But uh, it feeds into the, 
the civic engagement that I'm talking about, I think that's important. And I, I do respect institutions very much, because uh, I respect institutions uh, for the reason that there's a stability there. And if there are signs of instability, we, we reform uh, on that. But the Maoist approach, no, I don't believe it. You know. And I base my experience on tr uh, quite a bit of travel abroad uh, at times, and I've visited Peru a lot, and that suffered from that process. Very sad. Great people, but suffer from the process. The last question to the gentleman on the front here, because his hand was up almost first, and then we'll bring things to a close. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Christian de Vartavon. Um, I am a fellow here, and I've been serving on the APPG AI and blockchain for six years in Parliament with Lord Clement Jones and the one great Le Grand Chap. And I'm also partly French. So, first thing, I would like to rectify uh, something that has been said by the gentleman, I don't know who. The Académie Française actually has nothing to do with politics. The gentleman was probably referring to the uh, Institut de France, and having been almost elected an academician, I have a sort of knowledge of the fact that precisely these institutions have strictly nothing to do with politics. Now, Lord uh, Macfall, I would like to ask you, correct me if I'm wrong, but at one point you wish the admission uh, committee to lift the cap on, uh, to welcome non-party members as experts in the House of Lords. Um, and I think, unless I'm wrong, you even wish to talk to the Prime Minister about this, or in any case, what's your... But are you talking about, you know, non-political members? Yes. Yeah, I welcome that. We need non-political members uh, with experience. I mentioned to you about uh, Governor King. He's in the House of Lords. Who, who else do you think? Uh, Lord Rees, Astronomer-General, in the House of Lords. Uh, Lord Stern, you know, world-class global expert. Julia King, low-carbon technology, global expert as a result of that. Beban Kidron, you know, the online safety bill, you know, uh, Holly, which she did, Bridget Jones, uh, 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 diary in that. What did she do with the online uh, safety bill? She, she had a, a, a program uh, which she discussed with governments in Europe and Ireland, and it was a way forward for online safety bill, particularly for young children. She took it to America, and uh, she saw the governor of California, and her and the governor of California went to the White House as a result of that. Now, that all started in the House of Lords. So, if you like, the House of Lords can be an echo chamber for that because of the experts that we have in that. And we should have a mix of experts and politicians. And if we have a mirror image in the House of Lords of the House of Commons, then we're going to lose some richness uh, in our society. And what uh, Socrates said, true knowledge is admitting you know nothing. <laughs> right? So as the older I get, the less I know. And what do I want to do? I want to engage with other people. So that is really important. But the House of Lords uh, has an articulateness about it, but it has uh, an engagement with the wider society. And that it can emphasise issues which the House of Commons doesn't, doesn't do. And the House of Lords complements the House of Commons. It does not rival the House of Commons. That's very important. It's a fantastic way to end. We should definitely draw things to a close as we're into uh, overtime. Uh, it just reminds me to, to thank you all uh, in the room, all those in the room, and you see those still at the back, apologies, um, and all those online. Uh, who've contributed to tonight's discussion, which has been fantastic. I'm sorry we didn't get to more of your questions, but John will be taking away as his homework the five and a half pages, uh, John, yeah. we received. Well, I was advance. a school teacher, and as you a school teacher, Andy, you took it away. <laughs> Tell me the answers. <laughs> and you'll mark it after John. Um, uh, for those in line in the chat, there's a link to All Matters RSA, what we're up to, what we're doing including the upcoming event I mentioned at the start uh, with, with Chris Bryant, which will be fantastic, I think, on the 25th of yeah, uh, October on Commons reform. From what John said, a lot to reform uh, in the Commons uh, as well. Uh, if you're a fellow, you can continue this conversation, the John, conversation that uh, John and I have been having on our digital platform uh, circle. 
if you're not a fellow, crack on. There's still time. <laughs> um, it only remains then for uh, please join me um, in thanking tonight's distinguished speaker, John McFaul, for a fantastic presentation uh, and discussion, and one I'm sure, John, that will be continued. Please join me in thanking him. Thank you.